nucleotides are the very last reservoir of nitrogen. And so, if, for example, the degradation of purines forms uric acid, and uric acid can be excreted in, by the kidneys. Now, an excess uric acid, uh, if you get too high a concentration of uric acid uh, in your serum, then it can actually uh, crystallize in the joints and form gout. And one of the main uh, areas where gout is formed would be in the big toe. So uh, this is called podagra. Podagra. And this is where you get a gouty crystallization in the big toe. This kind of thing would typically happen whenever cells are turning over at a, at a, a high speed. So, for example, in leukemia, uh, take for example leukemia, you have the blood cells that are being produced and then broken down and uh, the amino acids are being released at a, at a higher rate than normal. And so the uric acid production is extremely high. You get kind of like a uric acidosis or a, a uremia. Now, this, was, this is called gouty arthritis whenever this happens, whenever it gets so high, the concentrations of uric acid get so high that it starts to crystallize. This is called um, gout, gouty arthritis. It doesn't only happen in the big toe, but that's just the main place that whenever you're thinking of gouty arthritis, or someone's complaining, I have t pain in my big toe, it's been going on for a while, I haven't had an injury, you think, okay, let me check for gout. But any joint can be affected. The nomenclature of nucleotides is pretty simple. If you just have the, uh, the base by itself, you just call it the base. So you have your uh, purine bases and your pyrimidine bases. And then if you add the, a 5-carbon sugar, a pentose, to these bases, then they would be considered ribonucleosides if the 5-carbon sugar is ribose, or deoxyribonucleoside if the 5-carbon sugar is deoxyribose. Then whenever you add a phosphate to the sugar that's attached to the base, it becomes a nucleotide. So ribonucleotides and deoxyribonucleotides. So again, you have the base, then the base and a sugar, the base, the sugar, and a phosphate. And you can have one, two, or three phosphates in a nucleotide. There's two pathways to produce nucleotides, and uh, so there's the de novo pathway, which basically it means making it from scratch, and there's the salvage pathway. And you'll have to notice that purines and pyrimidines both have different uh, mechanisms for de novo and salvage pathways. The de novo pathway requires a lot of energy, and so as adults, we primarily use the salvage pathway, but in uh, development, the de novo pathway is the primary way because you have to form new nucleotides. You don't just have a store of them waiting around to be salvaged, so de novo is primary in development and the salvage pathway primary in adults. Now, in the purine pathway, it's a little bit more complicated for de novo because you actually have to have phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate to form the ring structure, whereas in pyrimidines, the only time the, uh, the phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate is needed is just to incorporate the ribose. So what is phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate? That's this molecule right here. So this is ribose phosphate, and it has a pyrophosphate group attached to it. And so we're going to take a look at each of these four uh, pathways individually in a moment. So, but first, let's talk about tetrahydrofolate, THF. And THF is basically all of this molecule except this part right here. So tetrahydrofolate is used as car uh, one carbon carrier for nucleotide synthesis. And so you attach a carbon to the THF, and it can be used to synthesize nucleotides. And dihydrofolate reductase will regenerate the THF. Uh, that, mean, that makes dihydrofolate reductase a very important enzyme for development and, so, and rapid cell growth. Now just to be upfront, THF comes in a um, multitude or a variety of forms, so it can have different reduction states. But uh, just for the simplicity of this uh, particular uh, video, we're going to consider it as one thing, just and its job is just to carry one carbon unit. 
So in purine synthesis, the pure the purine ring structure gets built right on top of uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. So the first committed step in the reaction is where uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate and glutamine uh, condense together uh, and rele it releases a pyrophosphate molecule. And what you basically see here is that uh, purines are built from a multitude of different molecules. So you have uh, tetrahydrofolate pr providing two carbons here. You have spartate providing a nitrogen, glutamine providing two nitrogens, CO2 being added to the, to the reaction, and, and uh, glycine adding another nitrogen. All of this takes place and you have a, a ribose uh, nucleotide. It's inosine monophosphate. And just this part requires six ATPs. So one of the problems here is we have uh, inosine monophosphate, and we want to create roughly the, an equal number of ATPs and GTPs. And so how does that happen? So what we have here is uh, the ribose 5-phosphate from the pentose phosphate shunt gets uh, converted to phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate through the PRPP synthetase. And then the committed step, glutamine gets added to it in an amidotransferase reaction. And then we have 5-phosphoribosylamine. Okay, so the de novo pathway, several steps, we're going to produce inosine monophosphate. Now, inosine monophosphate requires a GTP to make ATP. Then it requires an ATP to make GTP. So if I have a buildup of GTP, it's going to drive it this direction to make more ATP. And if I have a buildup of ATP, it's going to drive it this direction to make more GTP. So this helps to ensure a balance uh, production of the two, so you don't get a whole lot more of one than the other. Now, PRPP is used not just for purines, it's used in the production of pyrimidines as well. So once we start getting a buildup of inosine monophosphate, it's going to feed back and stop uh, a couple of things. First of all, it's going to stop this committed step so that uh, glutamine doesn't condense with uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. And that way the excess PRPP can be directed down the pyrimidine pathway. But all of our ribose 5-phosphate from the pentose phosphate shunt, it could be used for several things. And so we also want to inhibit it from uh, condensing with the pyrophosphate to form phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. And so if we're, we're sending back a uh, message saying, hey, we have plenty of nucleotides. And look, you can see whenever we have GMP, it's saying, hey, we have plenty of nucleotides. Don't make any more nucleotides. We've got plenty of these. And you can see this, this feedback. So look at GMP, for example. It's feeding back and saying, hey, we got plenty of nucleotides. It's also feeding back right here and saying, hey, we have plenty of purines. And then back here, it's saying, hey, we have plenty of guanines. So this would shuffle everything over to the uh, adenine side of the reaction. And we want to shut down this de novo pathway as early as we possibly can because it costs a lot of energy. And so you have feedback mechanisms at every possible checkpoint along the way. Now let's look at the pyrimidine synthesis much simpler. Notice that first of all I can build my, my nitrogenous base without having PRPP being the first step stone. So you have a spartate contributing all of these, these three carbons and this nitrogen. Then you have carbamoyl phosphate contributing another nitrogen and another carbon. And there's your pyrimidine ring, the essential structure of it. Now, if you remember, carbamoyl phosphate was really important in the urea cycle. And so what you had basically was glutamine. Glutamine was giving up a, an ammonia and for, turning into glutamate. So I'll just put ATE glutamate. And then the ammonia was combining with uh, bicarb to form carbamoyl phosphate. And so that same carbamoyl phosphate that we saw in the urea cycle is important in the de novo synthesis of uh, pyrimidines. And so the nitrogen and the carbon from that pathway get incorporated into the pyrimidine ring. And then it can be added to uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. Now remember there's uh, of the
pyrimidines, the important ones, there's more than just uh, the two. So the purines, we had A and G, are the important uh, two purines. But in pyrimidines, we have uracil, cytosine, and thymidine. And this condensing with uh, PRPP uh, from, carb uh, from the pyrimidine ring only forms UTP. So we go from UTP to CTP, or we can go from UTP to DUTP to TTP. Now before I go on, I want to make sure I point out that the carbamyl phosphate made here, I, I mentioned a couple times the urea cycle, but the enzyme that's used in the urea cycle to make carbamyl phosphate is CPS1 and that's in the mitochondria. And this carbamoyl phosphate molecule that's getting incorporated in the pyrimidine is formed by CPS2, and it's in the cytosol. So it's a different enzyme catalyzing the reaction. And the main difference is uh, its location. So what you see is the carbamoyl phosphate synthase, uh, synthase 2 uh, requires some energy, some CO2, and the CO2 is really coming from bicarb, so HCO3 and uh, some glutamine. So the glutamine is going to give up the nitrogen. And we're going to get a carbamyl phosphate molecule. And notice that this is activated by ATP and GTP. So we're saying, hey, we have plenty of pu uh, purines. Let's do this thing right here. Get some pyrimidines being made. And so you see the big idea is that carbamyl phosphate and aspartate form the pyrimidine ring. The pyrimidine ring uh, merges or combines with phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate and then we get nucleotides. If however you want to nerd out just a little bit, I don't think this is this may be an overkill of information, but you get a, a more rounded view of what's actually happening. Carbamyl phosphate, aspartate or aspartic acid combining, uh, you're getting uh, using dihydroorotase to form the uh, dihydroorotic acid and then to oritic acid or oritate and going to OMP. This is by adding uh, pyro, uh, I'm sorry, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. And you see down here, this is our ribose 5 phosphate group that got added on. And then from that, we get a decarboxylation and we're at UMP. UMP goes through many steps, ultimately forming CTP or TTP. And that's essentially what it's trying to show you in this through a much more simple step-by-step uh, -step method.